morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. This morning, we're going to cover some things that we were discussing this last week, but we're also going to be looking at a document and considering what's being said for us within this document. Hopefully, we're going to have a good discussion on these items. So before we get into this, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his direction, and for his wisdom? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the hours of the Sabbath that we may assemble together and come before you. We ask, Father, that you direct us, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Direct our minds so that we might more clearly understand that which you would have us to know. May our minds be open and receptive to the leading of your spirit. Help us so that we might, as we open your word, understand that which you have presented before us for our edification, for our benefit at this time in earth's history. May your angels attend us. May your spirit guide us. May all be done to your glory. For this we ask in the name and in the power of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> now, last week we covered this portion of this unpublished document. We're going to finish this little foray, foray into Ezekiel 18. We're going to address several other points, all of which are interrelated to our main portion of the study of the Minor Prophets. It is essential to practice the principles of restoration. A Christian spirit must be maintained in all of this. The man, woman, or child who is deviating from the path of strictest rectitude must have their duty placed before them. Now, what does this mean for us? What are we to be practicing? How are we to practice these principles of restoration? Are we not in our relationship with others to help others see the very character of God and in so doing show them also further the character of Christ? And what does she mean when she is at when she is stating that the man, the woman, or child who is deviating from the path of strictest rectitude must have their duty placed before them? I mean, this has, it has to do with correcting others. But if we're if we're looking at correcting others, are we also not correcting issues within ourselves? Yeah. But, you know, the point here is this, in this we may be called mean, narrow, and cowardly. Right. Um, so, so this is the idea of res restoration. This is a work that we do in ourselves and uh, has to do with our connection and what we're 
what we're expecting of others. I mean, if if somebody is around us is deviating from the path of strictest rectitude, it's our responsible to place their duty before them. Mm-hmm. Yes. Strictest rectitude also means moral actions, moral thoughts. Now there, as you pointed out, in this we may be called mean, narrow, and cowardly. But is it cowardice to do right? Is it is it cowardly to stand up for the character of God? And shall we seal our lips and suffer sin to rest upon a brother because of this? These careless, slipshod principles are leavening the entire church. There is faithful work to be done in this, work that has been strangely neglected. Young men and young women, whether in high or lowly positions, have an influence for good or evil upon those with whom they associate and with whom they come into daily contact. Their words, their habits, their purity of conversation all show on whose side they stand. How many sides are there? Two sides. The promise of God, if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, and hath not oppressed any, and hath restored to the debtor his pledge, and hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity hath executed true judgment between man and man and walked in my statutes and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord. Ezekiel 18, 5 to 9. Now, this was being paired with letter 9, 1899, roughly two years later. Again, a non, an unpublished document. Everything is to be done in the presence of a holy God. Right principles are to be maintained with when dealing with those who are small as well as with those who are influential. That covers pretty much everybody, doesn't it? There is to be no haphazard work done in the service of God. The reason why so many difficulties arise is that those who complain most, who require perfection in others, exalt self and excuse their own defects. How telling is this statement? How specific is this admonition? It's very specific. Again, as we just did, we read, in God's word, we read of the qualifications which must be possessed by those who connect with his work. If a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not oppressed any, hath restored to the debtor his pledge, and hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, 
He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord. God requires moral perfection in some. Is that not what this statement says? No, it does not. God requires moral perfection in all. Those who have been given light and opportunity should, as God's stewards, aim for perfection and never, never lower the standard of righteousness to accommodate inherited and cultivated tendencies to wrong. Christ took upon him our human nature and lived our life to show us that we may be like him, partaking of the divine nature. We may be holy as Christ was holy in human nature. Why then are there so many disagreeable characters in the world? Is it because they do not suspect that their disagreeable ways and rough, impolite speech is the result of an unholy heart? We ought to be holy even as God is holy. And when we comprehend the full significance of this statement and set our heart to do the work of God, to be holy as he is holy, we shall approach the standard set for each individual in Christ Jesus. We now need, we need now to be terribly in earnest. God is watching the families who claim to be Christian to see how they are conducting themselves. If ever evangelical work was needed, it is now in our families, in our schools, in our sanitariums, and in our publishing houses. Let us consider the work to be done. Fathers and mothers need to feel the converting power of God upon their souls. The life needs to be cleansed. There are many professing Christians who have never been transformed in character. This is why the Holy Spirit cannot accomplish its work upon human hearts. It is not spasms of feeling a desire to do right that will give us an inheritance among the saints in light. Throughout our churches and institutions, there should be felt an intense desire to see souls transformed. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord, Ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb any more in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son of mine. Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Here again, we begin to see that she is repeating the admonition that we find beginning in Ezekiel 5 through verse 9. But the crux of the matter is, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The warning, warning here of Ezekiel is very clear. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. <clears throat> Repent and turn yourself from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Ezekiel 18, verses 30 to 32. 
God calls for a thorough purification and cleansings of households and institutions. There is need not merely of a revival, but of a reformation. Every church needs to be stirred as never before. When the light that God has given shines forth through human agencies, a great work will be done in demonstration of the spirit and with the power and with power will the truth be revealed in clear, distinct lines. But this work must begin in the church. Right? No, in the home. How clear is this admonition? If the work does not begin in the, in the home, how can it proceed to the church? We can't. So here we are given <clears throat> marching orders. We're given instruction. This thorough purification, cleansing of households, and then institutions, this reformation begins in the home, proceeds to the church, and then goes to the world. Now, this last week, I have been struggling with a document. There is a lot that we need that we're going to be looking at, but we're going to look at a couple of other points very quickly. Southern Watchman, March 31st, 1908, entitled Our Accountability to God. God has committed to us sacred truths for which he holds us responsible. He has given us mental and moral faculties that should be developed by education into a well-balanced mind and a symmetrical character. But education alone will not prepare a man to meet the object of his creation. He needs the grace of God. Divine power, united with human effort, will enable him to do good and to glorify his creator. What verse should come to mind if we are to do good and to glorify our creator? Should we not be looking at the second angel's message of Revelation 14? For how does it state? Are we not to fear God, to give glory to him, knowing that when we give glory to him, that we are providing the prophetic warning as God would have us provide it to the world. For is not the gospel a prophetic warning? Few appreciate the value of man and the glory that would redound to God were he to cultivate and preserve purity, nobility, and integrity of character. What does this statement mean to you?
what we need to study. It's not going to happen just on its own. What does it mean when it says the glory that would redound to God? Well, that means to come back to God. Does that not come back to him in the reflection of his character in us? Mm -hmm. So again, is she not showing this portion of the warning message of Revelation 14? In this, if we are reflecting God's character, are we not then giving glory to him? Absolutely. The value that God sets upon man is shown by the price that he has paid for his redemption. His love is expressed in that he withheld not his beloved son, but gave him to die for a sinful race. Angels could not, by any sacrifice that they could make, accomplish the work of man's redemption. It was only through the suffering and death of Christ that he could be restored to the favor of God. For our sakes, he who knew no sin was made an offering for sin. He was afflicted, insulted, oppressed, arraigned as a criminal. He suffered shame, insult, mockery, a cruel and painful death. Sin is the transgression of the law, and death is its penalty. Is there anything more clear that we have read so far? It was to save man from these that Christ suffered. Through his perfect obedience, the law was exalted. He will elevate man and give him rich and glorious possessions if he will respect the claims of God's law. But if he chooses to ruin his hopes of heaven by his stubborn sinfulness, he will lose those blessings. As we've been studying on Friday nights, in order to become righteous by faith, we must make the choice to surrender our sins in order to receive Christ's righteousness. If we will not do so, we choose to retain our sins. And if we choose to retain our sins, then we are accepting the penalty for the transgression of the law. To choose to be a sinner is to refuse to stand before the throne of God, washed from the defilement of sin. It is to refuse the riches of eternal glory, to refuse to be a joint heir with Christ to the immortal inheritance. It is to reject all of these, and choose instead the sure consequences of sin, the sinner's fixed doom. Is there anything that anyone would like to add to this at this point? This last week, as I was preparing other studies, this document, this unpublished document, came to my note. Now, portions of this manuscript can be found in Eighth Testimony, page 247 to 251. Yet the entire document had not been published until 2015. I found it interesting that the date 
in, that was affixed to this document, if we look at it on the biblical calendar, <clears throat> we would be looking at Tuesday, the 22nd of Nisan, in the biblical year 5948. Is that something that you put there? Yes. That, okay, fine. I noted that because it is the 22nd day of the first month. Now, in Daniel 9, we have Daniel's prayer. And he was noting that he had not taken any pleasant bread or any wine or food for 21 days. I found it interesting that this, if that, if my application is correct, and I, I'm very willing to be corrected, that Daniel did not take any food during the time, the first 21 days of the first month of his prayer. I found it interesting that this would be the day after the 22nd Nisan of the time that Mrs. White is, is presenting the following warning. Our position in the world is not what it should be. We are far from what we would have been had our Christian experience been in harmony with the light and the opportunities given us. Had we from the beginning constantly pressed onward and upward, had we walked in the light that has been given us, had we followed on to know the Lord, our path would have grown brighter and brighter. But many of those who have had special light are so conformed to the world that they can scarcely be distinguished from worldlings. They do not stand forth as God's peculiar people, chosen and precious. It is difficult to discern between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. What should we take from this paragraph? What is this saying to you individually today? Now, Mrs. White carries on. In the balances of the sanctuary, the Seventh-day Adventist Church must be weighed. She will be judged by the privileges and advantages that she has had. If her spiritual experience does not correspond to the advantages that Christ, at an infinite cost, has bestowed on her, if the blessings conferred have not qualified her to do the work entrusted to her, on her will be pronounced the sentence, weighed in the balance and found wanting. Daniel 5.27 By the light bestowed, the opportunities given, will she be judged? Now, if this judgment is passed, do we not accept that this, like the writing of the bloodless hand upon the wall of the Feast of Belshazzar, is many, many tekel you farsen. Do we not accept that this is a representation of the 2,520 gera taking those words at their mathematical equivalent? 
what is Palmoni saying to us here? For is Palmoni not... Go ahead, please. Yeah, it's the ones of all either receiving the blessings or the cursings. It all depends on our choices and lifestyles. So in this situation, we have a choice for if this warning is being given in 1903. This warning being given 120 years ago. Is this not just a warning for the church, but also for the movement today? It's interesting with the 120 years, by the way. Yes. Now, as we progress through this document, pay attention carefully to the different verses that she links together. God has prepared joy, peace, love, and glorious triumph for all who serve him in spirit and in truth. His commandment-keeping people are called and chosen to be in readiness every moment to receive increased grace and power and increased knowledge of the Holy Spirit's working. Many are not now able to receive the precious gifts of the Spirit, which God is waiting to communicate to them. They are not reaching higher and still higher for power from on high, that through the gifts bestowed, they may be recognized as God's peculiar people, zealous of good works. The nation of Israel was to be God's peculiar people before the world. Correct? Correct. Did they fulfill this position? Are we speaking of SDA? I'm speaking of Israel of let's say, 3,000 years ago? No. Did Israel of 2,000 years ago, of Christ's time, fulfill that position? No. Has the church today fulfilled that position? Uh, third time's a charm. No. At this point... The fourth for a three in one combination has a choice. We have a choice. Are we willing to reach higher and still higher for the power from on high? We are given the opportunity, we are definitely given the light. It is God's design that his people shall be a sanctified, purified, holy people, communicating light to all around them. It is his design that by exemplifying the truth in their lives, they shall be a praise in the earth. <clears throat> the grace of Christ is sufficient to bring this about. But let God's people remember that only as they believe and work out the grand principles of the gospel of Christ, can he make them a praise in the earth? Only as they use their God-given capabilities in his service will they enjoy the fullness and power of the promise whereon the church has been called to stand. If those who claim to believe in Christ as their Savior reach only the low standard of worldly measurement, the church fails to bear the rich harvest that God expects. Found wanting is written upon her record. Here again, 
in repeating Daniel 527. First, weighed in the balance, then found wanting. Okay, now the comment from the chat, Titus 2, 11 to 15, why? Well, as, as you were reading paragraph three, it came into my mind. It says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation, which is Christ Jesus, hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. When we are dealing in this, in this type of an admonition, What occurs when something is weighed in the balance? Do we not see that when something is weighed in the balance, that it is being investigated to see if that which is in the scale is of a balanced measurement? Or is it too light? So is there not an investigation before judgment is pronounced? Before it is stated that something is found wanting? Uh, yes. Solemn admonitions of warning manifest in the destruction of dearly cherished faculties for service. Say to us, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Be converted, be reformed, even as new converts are. Revelation 2 verse 5. It's talking about uh, dearly cherished facilities. Okay. Um, so is she referring to the to uh, the Review and Herald being burnt down? Could she be? Yes. I remember when that was. Wasn't that 1901-1902? I don't remember the year. Somebody knows. Okay. For did she not give warnings about not publishing uh, Dr. Kellogg's book at that time? And didn't they go ahead to publish it anyway? Yeah, that was 1902, uh, December 30th, 1902. Okay. So here we are in April of 1903, and she is making note of the destruction of dearly cherished facilities. Yeah, and San the Battle Creek Sanitarium burned on February 18th, 1902. Okay. Why is there so dim a perception of the true spiritual condition of the church? 
Are there not standing on the walls of Zion blind watchmen who do not perceive? How can a watchman stand on the walls of Zion and still be blind? Are not many unconcerned and well satisfied as if the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night rested upon the sanctuary? Are there not those in positions of leadership claiming to know God who in life and character deny him? Are there not many who count themselves as his chosen, peculiar people, yet are satisfied to live without the evidence that of a truth God is among them to save them from Satan's snares and attacks? Would we not now have much greater light if in the past we had received his admonitions, walked in the light as Christ is in the light, acknowledged his presence, and turned away from all dishonest practices? Then the light of heaven would have shone into the soul temple, enabling us to comprehend the light and to love God supremely and our neighbors as ourselves. Does this not also refer back to that which the Savior stated? Oh, how Christ is dishonored by those who, professing to be Christians, disgrace the name they bear by failing to make their lives correspond with their profession by failing to treat one another with the love and respect that God expects them to reveal in kind words and courteous actions. How specific is this for us today? Very, very specific. The powers from beneath are stirred with deep intensity. War and bloodshed are the results. The moral atmosphere is poisoned with cruelty and horrible satanic doings. The spirit of strife is spreading. It abounds in every place. Many souls are being taken possession of by the spirit of fraud, of underhand dealings. Many will depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. They do not discern what spirit has taken possession of them. One who sees beneath the surface, who reads the hearts of some men, right? Or is this one who reads the hearts of all men? All right. There it is. All oh, men. Says of those who have had great light, they are not afflicted and astonished because of their moral and spiritual condition. Brothers and sisters. Is this being said of us today? The prophet says, Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions, and will bring their fears upon them. Isaiah 66, 3 and 4. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11, 10, and 12. So, first, Christ says, they are not afflicted and astonished because of their moral and spiritual condition. 
the heavenly teacher inquired, what stronger delusion can beguile the mind than the pretense that you are building on the right foundation and that God accepts your works when in reality you are working out many things on a worldly policy? And regardless of the Bible standard, you are sinning against the law of Jehovah, which guards the interests of every being for whom Christ has given his life. Oh, is it a great deception, a fascinating delusion that takes possession of minds when men who have once known the truth mistake the form of godliness for the spirit and power thereof when they suppose that they are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing when they are poor and in need of everything. Here again, what's being referred to here? Is this not addressing for us again the warnings to Laodicea in Revelation 3? Uh, that's what it looks like. God has not changed toward his faithful servants who are keeping their garments spotless. But many are crying, peace and safety, while sudden destruction is coming upon them. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 Unless there is thorough repentance, unless men humble their hearts by confession and receive the truth as it is in Jesus, they will never enter heaven. When purification shall take place in our ranks, we shall no longer rest at ease and boast of being rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. When purification shall take place in our ranks, we shall no longer be Laodicean. How clear is that? Well, it's it's pretty clear, bro. Interesting, is it not, that while many of these paragraphs were published in Eighth Testimony, we are soon to come upon those that they chose not to publish. Yet here, this openly published portion <clears throat> has not been adhered to or addressed. Who can truthfully say our gold is tried in the fire, our garments are unspotted from the world? See Revelation 3.18 and James 1.27. Can two people, one, look up Revelation 3.18 and read it for us, and another read James 1.27? For what does this say to us today? So, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes of, that thou mayest see. I'll take James. <clears throat> okay. I'll take James. What's the chapter and verse? Uh, James one twenty seven. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father. And the father is this, to visit the fatherless, the widows, widows in their affliction, and to keep himself spotless, unspotless, unspotted from the world. So in this situation, on one side, we're being told to buy of me gold tried in the fire, to accept the white raiment 
that's freely offered and to make use of the heavenly eye salve that our eyes may be opened. And in the book of James, we are given further admonition because in this situation, are we not to understand that which is our responsibility? Now, as you were just reading with this, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. <clears throat> and we are to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. How often are we willing to do that? I saw our great instructor pointing to the garments of so-called righteousness. Here, she is being very direct. Because our garments of righteousness are as filthy rags. Correct? I'm sorry, you have to repeat that. Correct. Our, our garments of righteousness not like that of filthy rags? Is that not what scripture says to us? No. Yes, it does. It, yes, it does. Isaiah 64. Yes, it does. It does. The garments that we claim to be that of righteousness in oh. comparison with what Christ offers are <laughs> nothing more than filthy rags. I agree. Okay. <coughs> Stripping them off. Our great instructor lays bare the spotted, defiled garments beneath. The corruption the sin, the spotted garments, the filthy rags are unbearable. Then he said to me, can you not see how they have pretentiously covered up their defilement and rottenness of character? How is the faithful city become an harlot? Isaiah 121. My father's house made an house of merchandise, a place where the divine presence and glory have departed. John 2.16. For this cause there is weakness and strength is lacking. Brothers and sisters, we have been shown through that which the apostles did before Pentecost, what is to be before us. For if we are not willing to come into unity, if we are not willing to confess our sins one to another, if we are not in prayer and supplication seeking to become one with Christ, then how can we ever expect the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? How can we expect for this outpouring to occur before giving the final message to this world. We really can't at that point. It's 
So if we can't, are we not then found wanting? Absolutely. Is it our desire to look upon our garments, our filthy garments, and see written many, many tekel you farsen, weighed in the balance and found wanting? Is that what we want? No, that's not what we want. But unless the church, which is now being leavened with her own backsliding, repents and is converted, she will eat the fruit of her own doings until she shall abhor herself. I found this statement to be very pointed. When she refuses the evil and chooses the good, when she seeks God with all humility of mind and reaches her high calling in Christ, standing on the platform of eternal truth and by laying hold upon the attainments prepared for her, she will be healed. Then she will appear in her God-given simplicity and purity, <clears throat> separate from earthly entanglements and showing that the truth has made her free indeed. Then the men and women composing the church will be the chosen of God, his pleasant portion, his representatives, precious in his sight. The time has come for a thorough reformation to take place. When this reformation begins, a spirit of prayer will, will actuate every member of the church. And this spirit of intercession will cleanse from the church the spirit of discord and strife. Members who have not been living in Christian fellowship will draw close to one another. One member working in right lines will lead other members to unite with him in making intercession for the revelation of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> this sentence tells us that it only takes one person working in the right lines to be a leader. There will be no confusion because all of the members will be in harmony with the mind of the Holy Spirit, which imbues the whole being and impresses the mind to pray in accordance with the will of God. If there is one passage that clearly shows that the Holy Spirit is indeed a person a separate person from that of God the Father and God the Son. It is here because how can you have a person with a mind if that mind is already someone else's? All barriers separating mind from mind will be taken down, will be broken down, and God's servants will speak the same things. Are we seeing this occurring today? Negative. This unity is a gift of the Holy Spirit, a gift that belongs to God's children. Yet, it is a gift that is largely being rejected. Just as Christ's 
righteousness by faith is being rejected. So the gift of unity from the Holy Spirit is being rejected. The Lord will cooperate with his servants. All will pray understanding the prayer that Christ taught his disciples. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6 verse 10. The groanings and the longings of the Spirit are the expression of the intercession of Christ in behalf of his people, according to the will of God. They come from God and are returned to him in silent and in audible prayer. Now we're going to go into the portion that was unpublished. Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head to the earth and worshiped. Exodus 33, 18, 19. Exodus 34, 6 to 8. Those who through the enlightenment of God's spirit received a correct idea of their sinfulness will feel a deep abasement and humility of soul. They will not vindicate their course. They won't make excuses for what they've done, nor will they strive to belittle the wrongs that they've done. Making light of their departure from the right principles by evasion or by falsehood. So long as a man <clears throat> has no sense of God's presence, so long he will seek to excuse and to vindicate his course. But the moment that a man sees God as he is, <clears throat> that moment in the reflected light, he sees himself as he is. What vision is this? Is this the calzone vision? The marai? This is the mara. The vision of the looking glass. Because when we are comparing ourselves to God and we must look upon ourselves just as we are, Are we not seeing our faults just as a mirror would show us our faults? The moment that a man sees God as he is, that moment in the reflected light, he sees himself as he is. In the light of God's presence, the erring and sinful see their peril and their sin. Realizing the fullness of God's love, they humble themselves and accept mercy and pardon through Christ Jesus. 
listen to Daniel's confession. The Lord had spoken of him <clears throat> as a man greatly beloved of God. And yet what does Daniel say? I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and the mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned. And we have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, and to all, all the people of the land. Daniel 9, 3 to 6. Yet Daniel was one accounted as beloved, greatly beloved of God. But how did he see himself? He saw himself with his people. He saw himself as no better than they. How do we see ourselves today, brothers and sisters? I can't speak for everybody, but for myself, uh, I am that chief sinner. Okay. Proverbs 11.1. 1. Why? What's being seen here? I would I would put it down because it says that a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Correct. Yeah. So here we have the situation. Weighed in the balance of Daniel 5. Is the balance of the sanctuary a just balance? Yes. So if we are weighed in the balance and found wanting, are we being judged according to God's law? Uh, I'd have to say yes. Can you rephrase that? Can you, um, I'm not rephrasing, can you speak, um, say it again? What I said is that our, <clears throat> in, this, in this situation, if we are weighed in the balance of the sanctuary, are we not being weighed against God's law? Yeah, yes, I agree. Okay. Because God's law is a reflection of his character. Exactly. If we cannot reflect God's character, are we then not weighed in the balance and found wanting? It also says it, 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 the, the way is in the sanctuary, which is the law, right? It's in the sanctuary. Exactly. For where do we find the law in the sanctuary? The most holy place. <clears throat> Within the Ark of the Covenant, correct? Yeah. Correct. Correct. One of the other comments made from the chat, wickedly tenfold. For this is the way we are now. We nearly have the whole packet as well. Okay, would you please repeat that? That, that was a mistake. They didn't know the mic was on. Oh, okay. 
All right. So here, we now have Daniel 9 and Daniel 5 being openly and directly presented in this admonition to us today. The Lord heard this prayer. Its intensity and earnestness drew Daniel nearer and still nearer to God. The assurance came to him that God would answer his prayer. The simple petitions of a child of God may be uttered in broken sentences, as in the fullness of his heart, he unloads his burdened mind, casting his helplessness, his helpless soul upon the burden bearer. To every such a one, Christ says, let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Isaiah 27, 5. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they shall be wise, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they shall turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So now, Daniel 5. Daniel 9, Daniel 12 are all being compared as an admonition before us. I believe the point has been made many times that when Michael shall stand up, Michael, one who is like God by definition, who is Palmoni, who is the wonderful numberer, who is Christ. When he stands up, that this represents the ending of his ministration in the most holy place. And when he chooses to lay off his garments as intercessor and priest and now places upon himself the garments of vengeance to come as king and rightful ruler. This is the final close of probation for this world. Now, all three passages are being compared. All three are being combined. There will be those that will be found weighed in the balance. And on whom will be written many, many Tekel Eupharsin. There will be those who, like Daniel, will pray earnestly. That will accept the sin that has been committed but will seek to be cleansed of God. Both will exist when Michael shall stand up.
some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. As I read this document, the power behind this in comprising these passages into a document, into a example, was to me very powerful. How do you see this today? Do you wish to stand with Daniel in humility and prayer? Or shall we stand on the other side in the impious banquet hall saying, I have not sinned. I'm a good person. If God is truly just, he's going to save me because he knows that I'm so good. How are we to take this warning today? Wouldn't that mean uh, that God isn't actually just? Right. It would. Well, my thing, wouldn't it be also like being blasphemy? blasphemy? Yes. Do you even say such a thing? <clears throat> exactly. In all of this, we're being given a choice. Are we not? Absolutely. So, what is the task that is before us today? Are we not to come together to seek restoration with our brothers and sisters to remove and set aside our differences so that God's spirit can indeed be poured out. As I see it, this is the purpose of the camp meeting that is being planned. We need this upper room experience. We need <clears throat> to understand God's righteousness so that this message, <clears throat> the gospel, can be given in spirit and in truth, which it has not been. From 1840 to 1844, as we have studied, we see a glorious outpouring of the Spirit of God. Was it not powerful and did it not lead to reformation in many lives at that time? Have we seen this same power at any time since 1989? Have we seen people coming together as they did at the time of Pentecost in the 10 days before the outpouring on Pentecost? Has this since 18, 1989? Since yeah. 1989? Yes, as this occurred. I see it as being actually the opposite. Right. We've had a winnowing. The wheat and the tares have been growing together. It's not up to us to decide who is wheat. It is not up to us to decide who is tares. It is up to us that the message is given and that we are to find 
and look upon ourselves whether we have the character that reflects God's character or if we are showing the spotted character of the character of our own making. Who's no, I'd say the last one. Right. Whose robe do we wish to wear? Do we wish to wear the filthy rags? That which is of corruption that smells of death and destruction? Or do we wish to wear the unspotted robe by faith that Christ offers us. Well, the latter, but the former is so comfortable. Although it stinks a bit, it's still comfortable, at least to me. I mean, I, I can't speak for anybody else. I speak only for myself. Daniel spoke only for himself, and he placed himself with his people. Years ago, in the lower divisions, there was a song that at times would be sung, Dare to be a Daniel. How many of us today would dare to be like Daniel in accepting in his prayer his position with his people? Consider carefully this that we have been addressing today. We must examine ourselves, and it's hard because we really don't want to have to look at our imperfections. There are many that don't like what the mirror shows of their body, of their face, but how many are willing to look in God's mirror at their character? I agree from the chat. It is stated, it is my prayer that we would all be as Daniel. Daniel fell upon his face. Daniel was given a vision. In fact, he was given three visions. Too many times we may be benefited from the first and we might even be benefited from the second. But how many times do we shy away from having to examine our character in comparison with that of Christ? Any comments or thoughts with what we've just covered? Any questions at this time?
Shall we then close this session with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we have all sinned and we fall short of your glory. As we stand before you, we have nothing to offer. We stand before you in the rags of our own making, our own filthy rags. We ask for reformation. Help us to be willing that these rags may be removed. That your robe may cover us so that the shame of our nakedness would not show. Be with us today, Father. Show us that that must be done. that we may be able to freely release these comfortable, filthy, wretched, odorous rags so that we may be covered by faith with the righteousness of your Son. Direct us each one this day. Guide us as you would have us to show your character to others. For we may only do this by your spirit so that we may truly give glory to you. For this we ask, for this we thank you, and for this we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.